Well, it's an exciting morning in many ways because whether you realize it or not, we've kind of arrived at one of the pivotal moments in our study in the book of Esther. Probably for some of you heading into this study, there's maybe a verse that you probably knew maybe more than anything else out of the book of Esther. And it might be when we're all done, it will be the same. And it is that verse that's found in our text this morning for such a time as this. I mean, that's kind of what we've even put as our title for the series, just taking that verse and that reality. And in one sense, that's what we need to see this morning. See, we think about the book of Esther, and for you guys who have been traveling along with us as we've been making our way the last few weeks through this, you might begin to understand that Esther has, well, really three main themes that work its way through the book. Oh, we saw, we see a picture of spiritual war that's taking place, a preview in many ways of things to come. We see God's providence, just Him working behind the scene, just in majestic and powerful ways. But we also understand, again, this idea of opportunity, of how God works into our lives. And in many ways, as we approach it this morning, it's that focus that becomes really just just dead on for us to consider. This understanding that God has a plan for your life, that God has a purpose for your life and our lives, that who we are isn't accidental, that there's a part to play for every believer in the body of Christ. And this incredible reality that is kind of just displayed for us as we watch it take place in Esther's life, meaning for it to speak into our lives. Now, we think about what that looks like and this understanding that there's opportunities for us, that God has a plan for us. And well, last week we talked about how we get there. Well, that in one sense, how do we figure that out? How do we discover God's plan for our life? We surely didn't just accomplish all of that last week. We touched it a little bit and maybe hopefully shed some light toward it, understanding that God works that inside us, that He gives us desires, that God works in us as a body of Christ, that He uses us to encourage one another into the things that God has for our lives, that even sometimes just understanding our enemy's tactics become kind of a clear picture of, okay, this is just the, the road that God has for us. Those things and more help us understand, okay, how do we figure that out? How do we know maybe what it is we're supposed to do? Well, that's there for us. And then next week, we're going to look at how we actually walk in that. I mean, how do we actually, again, kind of taking steps that, that walk into that. And it might seem that those two go back to back. But see, actually, there's something that happens right in the middle. Something in the middle of of kind of discovering what God has for your life and the doing of it, there's a battle that takes place right in the middle that we want to focus here on this morning, a battle that we could kind of call it seizing, if you want to think about it this way, God's will, this place where we actually embrace that, where we actually begin to walk in it. See, think about it this way, it works so real. I mean, happens so in so many ways. Maybe it is that moment for you where God's guiding you to do something, maybe to share the gospel with somebody maybe to launch out in a new ministry or begin to walk in something and you, you begin to think about what it is and you think, okay, I think this is what God has for me. There's that discovery aspect that's needed there. There's the walking in it, but there's something again there in the middle that, well, again, we're just going to talk about it as seizing God's plan. And you might even recognize kind of the Latin phrase, carpe diem. It's worked its way into dozens of books and plays and movies and, you know, kind of just this understanding of, of, of this idea of grabbing hold of what's right in front of you, not letting what is there be just kind of robbed from you. And God definitely calls us to that. In fact, and perhaps one of the the major scriptures that kind of point that out tells us in the book of Ephesians this, that we ought to redeem the time, that we ought to be those who are redeeming the time because the days are evil. He says, you know, you got to be one that doesn't let time slip through your fingers. You know, that doesn't let those opportunities just pass. Grab hold of those things which are there. Redeem that time because we live in just really bad days that are going in the opposite direction. Now, that reality is held out to us. In fact, it's found in the context that it tells us, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is, which is what we talked about last week. Hey, know what God wants you to do. I mean, figure that out. I mean, I mean, it's, it's not the idea that you can do everything because you can't do everything. But you are meant to do something. And, and, and what is that? You know, know what God's will is and then redeem the time. And then right before that, he'll say, see, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. In some ways, that's what we're going to talk about next week. 
In other words, Ephesians kind of does backwards what Esther does forwards. That Ephesians is saying, you know, hey, live carefully, live precisely, redeeming the time, knowing what God's will is. And in many ways, we're kind of working backwards through that. Well, again, all that I'm hoping kind of just kind of begins to kind of work there. But if your mind's wandering, come back to this. There is this call to, to, to just take seriously, to redeem the time, to not let those things slip by. The New Living Translation of this verse says it this way, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Grab hold of those, seize those opportunities, make the most of them, don't let them just get by you, grab them. I mean, that's kind of the idea, that's kind of the concept, and that's what we want to look at this morning. Now, as we approach this, again, I I just pause and tell you, it's an amazing section. There are places, again, that just kind of point out realities, and certainly the reality of the book of Esther and the reality of this verse of, for such a time as this, is something that is meant to speak great into our lives. And I, and I have a sense that that which surrounds this is meant to be, not just so we'd understand what was happening in Esther, but that we get it for us, that it would give clarity into how do we do that, how do we redeem the time? How do we make the most of those opportunities? I think there's several clues given for us here. In fact, I'm going to kind of just give, kind of call it four keys that are given to us in this text for how we do that, for how we seize God's will. And I want you to kind of just think those through for a moment. And the, re- the absolute wonderful thing is we do this this morning. For some of you, you're right there. I mean, this is going to be like, wow, this is like reading my, my mail this morning. I mean, you just, you know what I'm wrestling with. Others, this is going to be where you are this week, but just opportunities given in one sense, how do we redeem them? Well, that's going to be where we go, but let's notice it in the text. You got your Bibles open there to Esther chapter four. Let's back up just a little bit for some context. We're just going to begin in verse eight. Mordecai is speaking or passing along a message to Esther And it says in verse 8, he gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan that he might go and show it to Esther and explain it to her and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and to plead before him for her people. Mordecai's communicating. They're communicating between a go-between, but he says, you got to go in. You got to go in and show her. Make sure she understands what's happening. Make sure she understands how serious this is, and then tell her to do something about it. Tell her that this is her opportunity. She needs to go before the king to rescue us. What tells us in verse 9, so Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. And so Esther spoke to Hathak and, and gave him a command for Mordecai. Did all the king's servants and people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king, who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go to the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. Again, that's where we were last week. I mean, this has been presented. I mean, what Esther needs to do has been presented. She sees it. Mordecai's encouraged it. She's explaining, hey, this is a difficult thing. I mean, in fact, it could cost me my life. If I go into the king and he doesn't hold out his scepter to me, I'm dead. That's what's going to happen. So Mordecai now deals with the objections, the questions, And he does so in such a powerful way that's effective for them, but again, I believe it's effective for you and I. Verse 13, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows? whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Wow. Well, we watch that. We begin to seek to understand what's there for us. And I want you to see the first part of it because in some ways it's so powerful. I mean, he just launches out there in verse 13 and and, and just calls her to a heart check. I mean, just read that one verse with me again. Verse 13, Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart 
that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Like, wow. I mean, like, out from the gate. I mean, like punching deep. I mean, it's kind of one of those places that's like, we're, there's, there's no kind of, you know, sidling up to this whole thing. No kind of, well, that's an interesting kind of a thing. And I mean, he just goes right for the jugular and says, okay, here's the problem. I mean, here's the thing, Esther. I mean, here's what you need to make sure you're doing. Don't think this way. Don't let this enter into your heart. Don't think that you're going to escape more than anybody else. I mean, they are incredibly hard words. Very penetrating. Now, I pause and think, well, I mean, part of the thing here, well, Mordecai probably really does know Esther. He raised her. If you've lost sight of that, Mordecai is her, is her uncle who, I mean, a cousin who raised her. And so he knows what's kind of her. And he's like, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I know what's going to be going on in your mind when you think about this. And that's probably true. But God also knows you. I think this was put there not just for her, obviously, but for us, because quite honestly, it's one of those things that happens. That right there, there's this thought that begins to happen, and it's, and it's so selfish. I mean, is this this moment where we're, we're just, we have this heart thing going on where we almost find ourselves thinking, you know, well, you know, I, I, I don't know, and there's a thought of almost wanting to hide, of almost wanting to pretend that we didn't see it, that we didn't see what's there. Again, imagine it with me. Maybe it's a simple situation. You're there, and maybe you, you get convinced that God wants you to share the gospel with somebody. It's maybe a neighbor or a coworker, and you're pretty convinced that it's there. And right there, there's something happening inside your heart. And if you're all together honest, there's this place that wants to pretend you have no idea what that is. I mean, just kind of like, just ignore it. Or, or maybe you, you see someone in need, and you're thinking about reaching out to somebody, maybe a homeless person, and you, and you see them, and you think, I, I probably ought to do something about that. And then there's this moment where you, you just want to pretend that you didn't. Or, or maybe you're thinking about starting a new ministry. Maybe you've looked around your, your town, or maybe in your neighborhood, and you thought, you know, we could really use a Bible study right in this neighborhood. I mean, I should open up my home, and we should just share the gospel with my neighbors. I mean, this would be a great thought, and you're kind of processing it down, and you're, and you're starting starting to think, you know, this might be what God has. And then there's this heart moment that if you're all together honest, what well, you guys get it, you kind of feel like being that proverbial ostrich. You know, it's like sticking your head in the sand, like, mm, nope, I have no idea what that whole, that, I didn't see anything. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what that whole thing is. That kind of thing where you want to be like one of the kids. It's like, la, 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 la. You know, I'm not listening. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what this is. I, 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 I don't know what's happening there where you could be kind of the monkeys in one sense, just, you know, I don't see anything. I don't hear anything. Or for you guys from my generation, kind of the, the proverbial Sergeant Schultz, you know, for some of you, you'll get it, you know, just the guy there, you know, it's like, I know nothing and I, I don't see anything. Now I know for some of you, it's like stuck on repeat. You're thinking about it right now. I know nothing. You know I mean? Just kind of just going through your brain and you kind of can do it better than I can. I, I get it. And I, but I want you to think about how real it is. Because there's this moment when you see something and you begin to think about it and there's just this part of you, it's like, that's going to cost me. And I could, I, there's a moment where I just want to pretend that I have no idea what that is, where I just want to not act, where I want to just pretend that there's nothing there in front of me. And that's exactly where just Mordecai Ames says, you don't think that way. Don't think in your heart that, that, that you could somehow hide from this. Don't, you, you need to make sure that you're not there. It's a serious issue. I think about it. Edward Burke said it this way. He says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. It's not a biblical quote. And maybe in its entirety, it's not entirely accurate biblically, yet it still has a nugget of truth there. And I want you just to ponder it for a moment. He says, here's the problem. I mean, the problem in our world just for evil to succeed is just for good people to put their head in the sand and, and pretend they don't know anything about it and just not act. I mean, not do what they, what they ought to do. I mean, that just temptation is there. I think about it and maybe it's altogether right, but James kind of just, he's, he's definitely one that speaks the same kind of language in the book of James. And he simply says it to us this way. He says, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. I mean, James can do that. I mean, he has a way of saying just the, the biggest things and the simplest sentences and just blowing away all excuses. I mean, it's kind of like, don't, here's the thing. If you know what you're supposed to do and you don't do it, that's sin. It's like, really? Like, oh, ow. I mean, 
See, we, sometimes we, when we think about sin, we think about sins of commission, that we, the things that we commit. I mean, we maybe lose our temper or are or, or, or jealous or that kind of thing, and we think, okay, that's sin, that is. I mean, those are things that God looks upon with displeasure. But there are also sins of omission, that things that we should have done, and we don't do them. And there's a part of us that wants to say, well, you know, that's fine. I mean, I could have. I mean, maybe I should have. I didn't do it. Oh, no big deal, you know? And James says, uh-uh. If you knew what you were supposed to do and you didn't do it, that there became a moment that by not doing it, you just sent. I mean, if you know what you're supposed to do, I mean, if it's right there in front of you and you see it and you're thinking, and there's this thought process going in there of, of why I shouldn't do it, he just kind of levels that, just kind of just guns upon that and tells us that's really important that you understand that now there's accountability there and responsibility there. That's exactly what Mordecai's doing. I mean, he's just looking at Esther and saying, here's the thing, Esther, don't think this way. Don't let it enter into your heart that you can hide from this, that you can escape from this, because you cannot. This has been laid before you, and to use kind of James' word, I mean, you're now accountable for it. I mean, you don't do this, and it becomes sin for you. I mean, it's this heart check kind of just explosion there, and again, it's powerful. It's altogether necessary. Let's see the simple realities. I know that you know this, but we can be so very, very selfish. I, I know I can. I think you can too. And for some of you, that's why it's, what's happening right now. There's something that you know <laughs> that you're supposed to do. Maybe it's sharing the gospel with somebody. Maybe it's starting up a ministry or a Bible study or starting to do something. And then there's this, like, I don't, can I just pretend I, I didn't even think about it? <laughs> you know, I just, can I just, no, no, you can't. I mean, that's what he's leveling. It says, if you're going to step into what God has, you must kind of do this heart check and says, don't think that way. And then he adds to it this. Verse 13, notice it again. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Mordecai gives a very sober warning. He says, here's what you need to understand if you don't do this. I mean, now you've seen it. You kind of see what God wants you to do. And if you don't do this, here's what you need to get. He says, well, then relief and deliverance will arise from another place. Now, I like this. Now, this is so biblical and so altogether right. I just want you to get it. Because there's a part of us that needs to understand this. Sometimes, sometimes we take ourselves too seriously. We begin to think, you know, the whole world depends on me. You know, I mean, boy, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, it's going to fall through. And sometimes pastors, well-meaning perhaps, missionaries and, and people who are trying to, you know, get people involved in things can, can almost make it sound that way. I mean, can kind of play almost the Edward Burke card. Like if, you know, all that's necessary for, for evil to succeed is, is if you don't do something. And it's almost as like the whole kingdom of God now depends upon you. I just want to say it doesn't. And he just tells him, you know, if, if you don't do this, God will. Because God's going to be faithful to his plan. God is going to be faithful to his people. If you don't do what God is giving you the opportunity to do, he'll use somebody else. See, God's going to do that. I mean, I, I just want you to understand the, the fate of the Jewish people, their existence was really not on the line. God would come through. See, I think about what it told us, Jeremiah would speak it to him, and he said this way. It says, thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, and the Lord of hosts is his name. It says, this is God. I mean, he's the God. He, he's, he's made the sun. He's made the stars. I mean, this, this, every day the, the sun rises and the stars are there, just this motion that's true within creation. And he simply says it this way. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. He says, that, you know, if the sun stops rising and the stars stop, stop shining, well, then maybe it could happen. But as long as the sun is there and the stars are there, Israel's going to live. They're going to be a nation before me. Their existence was not in doubt. I mean, God was somehow going to rescue them from, from the plot of Haman. They, there's no way that God was going to let them be destroyed. That was not going to happen. I also want you to understand, you know, we apply it in the New Testament sense. 
God is going to do his work. I love Jesus' words when he makes that proclamation in Matthew 16. He says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. It's this incredible declaration of what Jesus is and what Jesus is doing. And I just want you to understand, he is, he's going to build his church. I love the command given to us in the Great Commission. And he tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But then he just tells us, and lo, I'm going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. I just want you to understand something. God's going to do his work. And every now and then again, and I, and I get it, sometimes people have a sense of wanting to create some false sense of urgency. The kind of thing that they'll tell you, hey, this could be the last Christian generation. If, if you don't do something about this, we could lose the entire thing. I mean, the, the whole kingdom of God is going to blow up if you don't give to our ministry. I mean, that's the whole deal. I mean, this is the hour. And, you know, if you don't, I mean, and, and sometimes we can create this urgency that is not really true. It doesn't really work that way. God's going to do his work. And, and he just tells us, or he says, you know, again, if you remain completely silent at this time, then God will do something else. Relief and deliverance will come from another place. Now, before we pass that, I want to be careful about this because if, if you get that wrongly, you'll kind of almost sound like, you know, God's pretty quick to do that. That he's looking, he says, okay, if you don't do what I, the opportunity they have for you, then I'm going to just give up on you and find somebody else. Now, he can do that, but I also want to tell you, or God will send a whale, a.k.a. Jonah. Okay, it's a big fish. We don't really know it's a whale, but it kind of works that way. It kind of fits on the screen better than big fish. So uh, I mean, he gets do that. I just want to tell you, there's a thought that, that Jonah becomes this picture that God's pretty passionate about f you fulfilling your, his plan for your life. Jonah gets it. You know the story of Jonah right there in Jonah chapter one. God calls him to go to Nineveh. And then Jonah runs the other way. He, he tries to run away from God's plan. He tries to run away from God, what God has. And God sends a big fish to bring him back. Think about it this way. Does the graphic help? You know, you kind of see this. You're Jonah running away and get the big fish that comes and just takes him back. You know, I kind of like that. Can I do that again? Let's do it one more time. So you kind of get this Jonah running away. You know, if you're going to try to run away from God, God can send a big fish, you know, and he can get hold of you and he can bring you back to where you try to get away from. I just want to tell you that, that there's actually a picture of incredible grace in that that God is, he loves you, and he is more passionate about fulfilling his plan through you than sometimes you are. There are days that you want to give up on it, and God's like, I'm not giving up on you yet. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go great lengths and great strengths to try to help you walk in my plan for your life, and I just want you to know that, and if it works for anybody else, you just, I just hope you kind of hear that in the back of your mind. We, we joke about it on staff every now and then when sometimes we're like, I don't know, I think I might quit, and it's like, you know, you just got to hear like the Jaws music or something, you know, it's like, don't, don't. you know, there's going to be a big fish, you know, you, you try to get away from God, you could try to run from him, but you could, don't, don't, don't go down that road. I just want to tell you that God can do that, and, and he can, and sometimes in his faithfulness will absolutely pursue our lives. Nevertheless, he lets us know that if, if that doesn't work, if you just hard-heartedly set yourself against doing God's will in your life, then he'll use somebody else. And so he tells her that. Go back and notice it again, verse 14. If you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. He lets him know. He says, if you do this, yeah, God, God will rescue his people, but you'll perish. You and your father's house will perish. Okay, what does Mordecai mean? Does he literally mean that maybe Esther's going to die because of this? Hey, that's actually possible. I mean, he just kind of told her, hey, don't think that you can escape from this. Don't think that you're safe in the king's house. I mean, she's a Jew, and that's starting to become known. Although she had originally hidden it from the, them, Mordecai made himself just publicly known as a Jew. That's probably beginning to work backwards and, and, and find itself into her life. It could be really saying, hey, but you might literally physically die because of this. That's possible. But there's still some question whether that's what it's really saying. I mean, even if Haman did start killing the Jews, I mean, Esther's probably in the safest place in the kingdom. She might survive. But see, I want you to think about it this way, perishing. It, can, it, it, it means more than just to die. It means more than just to be killed. I mean, he might be saying, hey, that's going to happen for you. But I don't think that's the, the thing that God's speaking into your life and my life through this verse. 
I don't think he's telling us, hey, if you don't do God's will, you might die. Just want to tell you that, you know, just like, okay, that's great. Thank you. I mean, I mean, maybe that's true, but I don't think that's what he's saying. See, you can perish in a couple of ways. You can perish by actually someone killing you, that kind of thing. But you can also perish just by wasting away. And I'll tell you, I think that's what this is saying. I think that the warning is about wasting your life. There is a sense that you can perish just by never being used. Think about it this way. Does it help? Again, picture, you know, looking at a, a perishable fruit or something like that. You can perish not by somebody just going and chopping you up, but just never actually stepping in. And, and, and slowly just the decay begins to happen and, and the destruction begins to work into our lives. And we perish not because, you know, physically we die, This isn't the thought of losing your salvation or anything like that. It's just, you'll waste your life. You'll become something that could have been, that could have done something and didn't, and you just sat there. I don't know about anybody else. That's that's kind of just a tragic thing. I mean, I get that way even over fruit and stuff like that. I don't know about anybody else, but if, if I go into our refrigerator, we find that. It's like really, really, really gross, but it's like, oh, we wasted it. I mean, that could, I mean, if we would have eaten it when it was good, we could have had it, and we, and we let it waste. I, I hate wasting things. I, I, I hate that, that, we, that we let it perish. I didn't want to let it perish. I, I, you know, I know it's, it's, a, it's a perishable food, but, and, and, and I, I didn't mean to let that happen. But it can happen in our lives. John Corson, pastor commentator, says it this way in his commentary. He says, if you're not interested in God's work, if you'd rather complain about your difficult situation or cruise through in your easy one, if you're just going to live in your life and just complain and just rest and cruise and, and not be passionate about, God, I want to do your will with my life, he says it this way. He says, you know, God will get his work done, but you'll perish, not physically, but in the vibrancy of your walk and the joy of service and the opportunity and blessing of being used will be absent. Your life will just perish. You'll shrivel up spiritually. You'll, you'll dry up just there, and there's this sense of just missing what that is. Again, I want you to understand, this isn't a threat against our salvation. If you don't walk in what God has for you, it doesn't mean you lose your salvation. You can, you can be saved and, and, and miss this, but you'll just have a life that misses its significance, that you'll perish. And I want to just tell you, there's something about this that just is an encouragement. It's like, don't waste your life. Don't waste who you are. Don't waste what God is doing. I mean, that's what Mordecai's telling her. He's telling her, hey, I don't want you to do that. I mean, I don't want you to be one that does this. And so he's giving her this sober warning. That could happen. If you will not do this, if you remain completely silent at this time, God will do it through somebody else, but you will waste your life. You'll perish. You'll miss what God has for you. You'll miss the wonder of what that is. Now that's serious. And again, in one sense, it's a sober warning, but it's a good one. It's like, we need to hear that. It's like, okay, I don't want to do that. I don't want to perish. And so then he encourages her. I mean, those are a couple like hard things. I mean, don't quit being so selfish, you know, and don't waste your life. But he encourages her with this there in verse 14, go back to it and notice it again. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Let's take that last part of it for a moment. Again, it's that, the major verse that, this, that you should know and maybe will remember out of the book of Esther. And it's an idea of embracing God's providence for such a time as this. For such a time as this, God is working. That your life isn't an accident. That you were born when you were born and where you were born and who you are. What if there's a thought of looking and saying, for such a time as this, I'm here. I mean, there's sovereignty at work in this, there's providence, and there's this amazing thought that God is doing his work in this world through people. That some of the things he's doing in this world, that God is accomplishing his work through providence and providential ways. I I know that you probably get this, but it's worth just processing for a moment. Sometimes when people think about God moving and that God acting, they think about it like the way that people will use it in like insurance claims, you know, and, you know, acts of God, you know, usually meaning like tornadoes and hurricanes and you know, any kind of those things. And sometimes that's how people think about God acting. It's like, okay, well, if God really like explodes into the situation, that's an act of God. But what Esther is letting us know is that God is at work in things that sometimes we didn't actually recognize he was at work in. And getting the job maybe you got maybe getting you in the position where you are. 
I mean, that Esther gets promoted to be queen. I mean, there she gets, and he's saying, don't think you got there by accident. Don't think that somehow it just was an arbitrary thing that you are where you are. I mean, for such a time as this, you're here, and God is providentially doing this. I mean, you didn't orchestrate all of that. Esther didn't kind of position herself into this place. She's just there. And he's calling her saying, no, can't you understand that God's moving, God's doing something. He's inviting her into this place where we would believe in it, where we would look for God's work for our lives. Can I say it again? In our, in our st- study of Esther so far, we've referred to it so many times, I'm kind of worried that it's starting to become, to lose its power, but it's such a powerful verse. Ephesians 2 tells it to us this way. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It says, this is who we are. In Christ, if you're a believer, God works on us. He, we're his workmanship. He's shaping our lives And he's preparing opportunities for us for such a time as this. He's creating opportunities that we can walk in those opportunities, that that we can do that. And that's what he's asking for us to do. And there's something about just beginning to believe that, to beginning to say, okay, I'm going to believe that it's not an accident, that there are things that God's working. And it's not just, you know, circumstantial that I'm where I am. I'm going to begin to look where I am and say, God, what do you want to do through me? Charles Spurgeon says it better than I can. In his comments on this, he says, every child of God is where God has placed him for some purpose. And and practically, this ought to lead you to inquire for what practical purpose God has placed each one of you where you are now. Again, don't don't try to find exception to that. Yeah, there are sin and places where God would bring us out of it. That's not what we're talking about. But he says, every child of God, God has worked in our lives. He's put us in places and positions that if we really get it, we would begin asking, so God, why? Why? what is it you want me to do where I am? I mean, you know, what is that? And he says it so well. He says, if you've been wishing for another position where you could do something for Jesus, do not wish any kind of thing, but serve him where you are. See, here's the thing. Some of us do it. I mean, we think, you know, if you know, we think of ways we could serve God, you think, you know, if I were a billionaire, I would really get behind like missions. You know, I would just, I'd do incredible things around the world. And we think, oh, I know if I were really, really smart, you know, I would, you know, do great things for the kingdom of God. If I could sing well, I would just really kind of lead people in worship. If I could, you know, speak well, I'd preach the gospel. And we come up with all these things of, you know, if, if something were different in my life, I'd serve God. And we w- find ourselves wishing to be somebody else other than we are, wishing to have something else other than we are. Instead of just saying, you know what? No, God, I, I, I am who you've made me to be. And this isn't an accident that I'm here. And instead of spending all my time wishing I was somebody different than who I am, maybe I should embrace, God, you've placed me here in this, in this neighborhood, in this job, and, and God, there's got to be something in that. Spurgeon goes on to give a couple applications that will maybe help from a different perspective. He says, are you rich? God has made you a steward. Take care that you are a good steward. Are you poor? God has thrown you into a position where you could be a be- better able to give a word of sympathy to poor saints. He says, you know, our, do you live in a godly family? Is that your, your heritage? Then God has a motive for placing you in so happy a position. Are you in an ungodly house? Well, you are a lamp hung up in a dark place. Mind that you shine there. I mean, wherever you are, wherever you are, shine there. Believe that God has put you there for such a time as this. I mean, believe in his providence. Believe that God is bigger than you've ever imagined. And believe that, you know, he puts you and, and begin to look for it. Where you think, God, what do you, what, what do you have for me? I mean, I don't want to miss that. I, I, I don't want to miss my purpose. I, I, I want to do that and believe that, God, you've, you've put me here maybe for such a time as this. And, and begin to think that through in the way that we walk in the, the path in our lives. I love that. I love the reality of it. And again, there's something about just believing in God's faithfulness and that that could totally transform the way you're looking at your life right now. But as he adds that to it, he says it in a way that I think is incredibly powerful. Would you go back and notice it with me? We'll just read all of verse 14 for the context of it. It says, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time 
as this. So to embrace what God has for your lives, there are things that are key. There are things that are there. I mean, got to have this heart check so that you're not going to be selfish and not just hide yourself in the sand and think you can kind of ignore it. There's a sober warning that you could miss it, that you could, you could miss the significance of what God has for your life. There's a place of believing in his providence. But he adds this other thought, and I just want you to notice it by the way that he says it, because he says, yet who knows? Yet who knows? Yeah, well, there's something about embracing the unknown, that there's a sense of looking on this and, 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 and stating it. And what I want you to understand is they don't really know. They haven't read the rest of the book of Esther. They don't really know if this is going to work. I mean, they don't. I mean, it's a possibility that this is how God is going to save the Jewish nation. But they don't know that. And, and he doesn't say it that way. He doesn't say, no, this is it. You know, if you don't, I mean, you're going to be the way. He says, who knows? This might be the way that it happens. And I just want you to know, rarely do we ever know going into doing God's will. Rarely do we ever know if that opportunity is really God or not. I mean, there's always this place of embracing the unknown, of wondering if it is. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. I mean, there are a few times in Scripture where they absolutely know. When God speaks from heaven and the voice reverberates and tells, you know, Joshua, go take Jericho. Okay, that's, we, we, we don't have to, that, that's God. We know that. But most of the time, that doesn't happen in our lives. Doesn't happen in mine. Doesn't happen in yours, I don't think, either. And so sometimes there's this place, and, and maybe you got this. Maybe you know this. Maybe I'm stating something so obvious. But if you didn't recognize this was there, sometimes this becomes the hang-up. Sometimes this becomes the holdback because you sit there and you thought and you begin to have this conversation with yourself. You know, if I knew that God was in this, I'd do it. I mean, if I knew that God, if I really knew that it was going to work, I'd walk in it. But I'm uncertain. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's going to work. Maybe you're sitting there again and you're thinking about sharing the gospel with someone in your family. And you're thinking, you know, I I think God might want me to tell them something. But then you begin to have this conversation in your mind. It's like, well, but I I don't know if he does. Maybe he does. What if it doesn't work? (laughs) What if I share the gospel with them and they hate me? What if they blacklist me from the family? What if I destroy the entire family gathering that's getting together for Christmas? Because I went, I I mean, I I just, God, I'd be willing to do it if I know that you're in it. But you don't know. I mean, sometimes it's there and you're thinking about, maybe again, somebody really is thinking about starting a Bible study in your home and inviting your neighbors. And you're kind of like, well, you know, God, if I know you're in it, I'd do it. I mean, if I I knew that it was going to work, I would be glad. And you're kind of waiting for some kind of confirmation, some kind of like, yes, this is going to work. And, but you're also aware it might fail. I mean, I might, I might try all this. And I mean, as far as Esther knows, she doesn't know if it's going to work. I mean, she ends up telling Mordecai, you know, what she's going to do. And you can just scan down there in verse 15. It says, Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go and gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. We'll talk more about that next time. But I just want you to know she, she, she knows that's a possibility. I mean, she's not sure this is going to work. I mean, Maybe she'll go into the king and he won't hold the scepter out and she'll die. But it could happen a whole lot of things in between there. Maybe he'll hold the scepter out and she'll plead for the Jews and he'll tell her no. And she won't be able to do any good whatsoever. She does not know if she's going to be the vehicle that saves the Jewish nation or not. She is going to be. This is how God is saving the Jewish nation at this moment. But she doesn't know it for certain. I, I just, I've got to tell you how much I love this because in my mind, it's, it's so real. And again, for some of you, that's where you are. I mean, you're wrestling through things. And for some of you, you've gotten so close to doing things for God. And right here and right at this wrestling is where you back off because you're, not, you're just not certain. You're kind of like, I, I just need to be certain. I need to, I need to know. But there's something about embracing the unknown, about this idea of not just accepting it again in uncertainty, but kind of embracing it saying, God, I, I, I just embrace that I don't know what's going to happen. 
that I don't know how this is going to work, that I don't know if it's going to work or not. There's something about walking in that where it becomes, you know, just there. See, I ha- this happens so often in my mind that I'm assuming it happens some in yours, where there'll be something that I think that God might be guiding me to and to, to do, and, and I'm dealing with these very objections. Yeah, I'm being selfish. Yeah, I gotta, gotta not, not, can't, can't hide myself from this, and boy, what if, what if, what, you know, I don't want to waste any opportunities God's putting before me, and boy, you know, I, I don't want to miss his providence. I mean, I'll be wrestling through these things honestly in my mind, but then this one will often become quite a stumbling block. It's like, well, I just don't know. I mean, is this really God or is this Jim? I mean, did I think this up all by myself? You know, is this just some crazy harebrained idea that I've come up with? And, and I don't do this for everything because there's a number of factors that would have to get me that close to doing it. But I have this conversation with myself that goes something like this. You know, the idea, it's like, well, you know, I would rather try and see if God's in it and find out that he's not in it and walk away going, well, I guess he wasn't in that, then not try and never know. Never know if maybe God would have used me if I'd given him an opportunity. And, I, you know, I, I kind of have this conversation like, you know, I don't know if it's really going to work or not. I don't know if this is really God. I mean, I've done a number of things in my life that, you know, you, you kind of attempt to do something you think is going to be great for God, and then it just like kind of blows up into dust, and you're like, okay, that was Jim. <laughs> that wasn't God. You know, it's like, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that happening a little bit. I mean, I'd rather that happen. I'd rather try something and it totally fail and just find out, okay, that wasn't God than to allow myself to be talked out of trying something that maybe it is God. Maybe if I share the gospel with this family member, what if this becomes the turning point in their soul? What if this becomes the moment that they turn their lives over to Jesus? I mean, I mean, it might not happen. I mean, I might try to share with them and it just like totally blows up in my face and they don't listen. But, but what if I do? And what if that becomes this moment where everything changes? I mean, I, 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 I so want that that I'm willing to fail. That, I, that I'm willing to say, okay, well, you know, I, it might not work out, you know, and, and I know that going into it. And there's something about embracing that. There's something about just saying, okay, that's exactly what I get. And, and, and I understand that's what God is calling me to. See, I, I just want to tell you, I love this because, see, I, this is what Mordecai is telling to Esther, and this is what's going to help her step into this opportunity that God has for her. But I really do believe that, you know, there are sections of Scripture that become kind of like the prescribed section for things in life. I think this is one of the prescribed sections where what Mordecai is telling Esther, God's telling you, and it's something we need all the time. Again, somebody sitting here this morning, and it just couldn't be more real. I mean, you're like, that's where I am. I think God might be directing something in my life, and I'm so uncertain, and you're trying to decide. For some of you, it's going to happen this week. It's going to launch out of the blue. You weren't expecting it. You're going to have an opportunity to share the gospel or maybe reach out to somebody and, and, and show mercy and kindness. I mean, it's just going to be there. And, and what, you're, what I want you to understand is this begins happening. I mean, you begin finding yourself there and, and, and the stuff that begins to happen in the midst of it is, is this stuff that's happening inside you. And I just want you to, t- to hear it in a way that comes back and just, okay, quit being so selfish. I mean, right off the bat, let's just let's do a heart check. I cannot hide. I cannot pretend that, this, that I don't have any part to play in this world. That's a lie. Let's just, let's deal with that. And I, and I don't know about you, but sometimes I just have to have these conversations with myself. It's like, don't do that, Jim. Don't hide your head in the sand. I mean, don't, don't be so selfish, you know? I mean, just don't. Because you don't want to waste your life. You don't want to get to the end of it and think, boy, I, I you know, I, I miss so many opportunities. I don't know about you, but... When we get to heaven, I know that God's going to show us so many things, and I'm interested and scared to find out how many opportunities I've missed. I mean, I wonder if God will let us see it, if we'll be able to look back and, and, and he say, you know, you had such, here was a moment, this was a God-ordained moment that I had orchestrated in your life for such a time as this, you existed and you were completely silent at that time. And I had to use somebody else. And you missed it. 
I, I just wonder what that would look like in our lives. I mean, I think God's going to comfort. I don't think that heaven's going to be his place where, but I, I'm just, I, I just, I don't want that. I mean, I kind of want the other side of it, that God could look upon me and he'd look upon you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I gave you to do. You walked in those things. See, I think about it. I just gave you the verse and I can bring it back to you from Ephesians. Just he's commanding us to make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. He's calling us to do that. I think about that, and as I process that through, there are some quotes from famous quotes that you might recognize, but that just kind of penetrate into my heart, and I want to just give them to you that maybe they will as well. Jim Elliott, who most of you know, just missionary down to Ecuador that with the five others ended up dying, you know, but their lives just walking in God's plan that literally did change so much in the world, though it wasn't the way they thought it would be. He looked upon it and he just simply said it this way. He says, wherever you are, (laughs) be all there. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, embrace God's providence. I mean, just be where you are. Don't wish to be where you're not. Just wherever you are, be there. And then he just said, you know, wherever, just live to the hill, every situation that you believe to be the will of God. If you think God's in it, pour yourself there. I mean, just think, okay, I think this is what God wants for my life. Then pour your life into that. And then he says kind of the motivation behind that, the thing that he's perhaps most famous for for stating in the midst of his own decisions. He simply said, you know, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He says, you know, I'm going to lose it anyway. I'm going to lose my life. I'm going to lose these, you know, but there's there's no fool to give up what I couldn't keep anyway to gain things that I could never lose, to look for eternal treasures. Wow. William Carey said it this way, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. He says you ought to expect that God wants to work through your life and you ought to be willing to say, God, I'm I'm willing to attempt it. I'm willing to go, who knows whether God will use me or not. I mean, I don't know if he will, but I'm willing to give that chance. I'm willing to step into it. I'm willing to do that. And, and that wrestle so needs to happen to draw us into where we are. Now, here's the wonderful thing. Some of you, you, you go through this and you've walked through this in numbers of ways victoriously. And I'm so glad. Some of you just need that reminder and strength. And again, just to say, you need to keep doing this. But maybe again, for somebody here this morning, you are being robbed of God's plan for your life because you are missing it right here. You're, you, you're letting yourself become selfish. You're letting yourself kind of in that sense not believe that you're here for a purpose, that you're kind of waiting because you're, you're just uncertain and you allow that uncertainty to keep you from trying to do anything. And I'm just going to tell you, I want you to see it. And I want to just tell you from God's word to your ears for such a time as this, who knows? Who knows if you haven't come into the situation, the place, the positions that you are for this very sovereign moment. And it is so worth trying, giving God an opportunity to work with your life. Just long that that would be true of you. So that's what we want to pray for. So you can close your Bibles and notebooks and things that you have open. And we just want to just ask that God bring us into that right now. Just to surrender our lives to that. Again, I I hope to say this in a way that's helpful no condemnation. I mean, maybe for some of you, you're hearing some of my words this morning and you're thinking about how many times maybe you have missed it. And maybe you have. But there's forgiveness with him. And I love Paul's words. Let's forget those things which are behind and let's press ahead. I believe in God's providence. I believe in his sovereignty. I think you're still here. And if you're still here, I think God's not done with you. And there's something about saying, God, I just... I don't want to waste the rest of my life, whatever that is. Maybe it's weeks, months, years. I don't know. I just don't want to waste it. I don't want to perish. I don't want to be that piece of fruit that just sits on the shelf and never gets engaged, never gets used, and slowly begins to mold and slowly gets to to, to die, never having stepped into what God would have for my life. I just want to invite you to kind of gaze at that in the future and say, God, let's, let's redeem the time. Let's, let's, let's live in this moment. Let's make the most of the opportunities that God puts before us and not be robbed of them. So let's pray for that. Would you join me? Father, we thank you that you indeed are a God who is working and you're doing amazing things. And I love the big things. I love the dramatic things. 
But I also love the providence, the things that's happening behind the scenes, things that we might not have seen as miraculous, yet they were so miraculous that Esther would be queen, and that she would be in the right place at the right time to use her influence to save a nation. God, I believe in your providence in our lives that for such a time as this, we exist, we're here, that you're putting us and orchestrating us and drawing our lives into things that you have for us. And Lord, if we've been resistance to even to that, would you open up doors to bring us into everything that you have for us? But Lord, as we long for that, as I long for it, help us not to lose the battle in that inner struggle of selfishness and doubt and fear and just not accepting that, that you really want to work through our lives. Lord, help us not to perish. Help us not to waste our lives. God, just pray for that. Lord, we, we ask for forgiveness where we have, for the opportunities where we failed to, to, to use those opportunities for you. Would you cover that with your mercy? Would you wash it with your grace? Would you help us to know forgiveness even now and even now no condemnation? Lord, I pray that you take my words to create excitement, anticipation. Who knows? Who knows what you might do with our lives? God, just that we would be willing to walk in that. God, where you're speaking that very specifically right now, help us to get it and grab it and walk in that. Where you're sowing this into our lives for opportunities we're going to have this week or in weeks to come, help us to get it and, and to recognize the battle and overcome and press into those opportunities that you're going to give us. God, make it so effective in our lives right now that we would redeem the time that we would buy it back, that we would make the most of the opportunities that you're giving us. Please, Father, we ask for that because you're such a faithful God working it. You're such a faithful God, such a faithful Father. Lord, help us to know that right now. And we just, we're asking that from your hand. We're asking it together in Jesus' name. Would you guys take a moment and just continue that prayer and, and just wherever that's found you and it might be just right now. I mean, maybe like one of those four is your battle right now. Maybe it's selfishness. Maybe it's the idea of wasting your life. Or maybe you just don't believe in God's providence that he really is put you in this world for such a time as this. Or maybe it's the fears of the unknown, the who knows. I don't know what it is quietly between you and him. Would you talk to him though about what he's talking to you about? I'm going to do that as well and then we'll close in worship in just a moment. Jesus, I'm so thankful for your faithfulness. I believe what you said, that you will build your church and nothing could stop that. Nothing would resist your work. The gates of Hades would not withstand it. Lord, you're faithfully doing a work in this generation. You are the alpha and the omega. You are the beginning and you will be the end. You are faithful through the whole process. Lord, you're doing a work in this moment, in this generation, at this time. God, I believe it because I believe you. I believe you're faithful. God, in your faithfulness, would you help us to engage? Would you help us to be a part of that? Would you help us to walk in those opportunities that you lay before us, those good works that you put before us that we could walk in? Help us to do it. Help us to overcome that resistance that would talk us out of it. 
Father, I just ask for your help in that right now and just thank you for your incredible faithfulness, your ability, your just work in us, and I trust it into your care. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, guys, why don't you stand? We're going to close with a final song of worship and just celebrating the greatness of our God. If after this, God is working your life, maybe you don't even know Jesus. Maybe you're kind of in the midst of this and part of through all of this is just the faithfulness of God and Him seeking to draw you to Him. We would love to be a part of that. Pastor Phil will be up here at the end of the service. The worship team will be here. I'll be in the back. Grab one of us. We'd love to talk with you and pray with you about what God is doing in your life and so long that that would be there. And yet so much longing in the midst of it that God would just meet you in His great faithfulness. And give you the benediction there out of number six, just as God just work upon your life. Just asking that the Lord would bless you and keep you. That the Lord would make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. That the Lord would lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God is able. God is able. He will never fail. He is almighty God. Greater than all we seek. Greater than all we ask. He has done great things. Lifted up. He defeated the grave. Raised to life, our God is able. In His name, we overcome. For the Lord, our God is able. God is with us. Are on his side, he will make a way far above all we know, far above all we hold. He has done great things, lifted up, he defeated the grave, raised to life. Our God is able. In his name we overcome, for the Lord our God is able, God is with us, he will go before, he will never leave us, he will never leave us, God is for us, he has opened arms, he will never fail us. He will never fail us. Lift it up. He defeated the grave. Raised to life. Our God is able. In his name we overcome. For the Lord our God is able. Lift it up. He defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able, in His name we overcome, for the Lord our God is able, for the Lord our God is able, for the Lord our God is able. Oh, Father, we rejoice in you. And just, Lord, that there is nothing that's too hard for you. We rejoice, Lord, that you go before. Lord, that you lead us into the things that you have for us, that you've placed us in situations to do your will, Lord. I just ask now that you would empower us to do it. You'd cause us, Lord, just to step out in faith. We thank you for the word we've heard today. Lord, continue to speak to our hearts. 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you.